to another educational webcast from FEC. We've created it for your information and professional competence purposes. Hopefully, after watching this webcast, you should feel more confident when confronted with a similar clinical situation. This information should increase your understanding of CPGs and help you to become a better practitioner. You should understand that webcasts are not intended to replace a full training course, but watching this webcast should definitely help inform your practice, improve your clinical effectiveness. Practitioners must only act in accordance with CPGs and their current scope of practice and status on the register. In paediatric practice, the commonest cause of seizures we see are febrile convulsions, epilepsy, uh, children who've sustained a head injury, um, perhaps poisonings, um, hypoglycemia. In paediatric practice, when you come across a child who's seizing or who's had a seizure, it's extremely important to check glucose and temperature as these are the two most reversible causes of seizures and there's something we can act on immediately. It's important to establish whether the child has a temperature because if they have, uh, then we give paracetamol within your scope of practice. Um, but then beyond that, it's important to establish the cause of the temperature, whether this is a local illness or whether there's a systemic unwellness. Um, and a lot of this information will be gleaned during your secondary survey. Most children we see in emergency departments with temperatures are very well and are suffering from a local infection such as a sore throat or an earache or a tummy bug. Um, with treatment and antipyretics, they bounce back very quickly. But also we see children who instantly we know are unwell um, and these children often have sepsis. Uh, and more severe causes for their temperature. And it's important to be able to establish the two different groups um, because both of them are going to be managed differently. It's also important to remember that children who are either very young or maybe immunocompromised for whatever reason may not exhibit the classic signs of infection or may not even have a temperature. Meningitis is a localised inflammation of a covering on the brain and spinal cord and as such the symptoms and signs remain localised to that illness. Whereas meningococcal septicemia is sepsis in the bloodstream um, which invokes a system-wide response and usually all organs are involved. So the symptoms and signs will be quite different in both illnesses. So viral meningitis is a very common illness, um, usually presents like a flu-like illness and in most children is not a severe form of an illness. Um, viral meningitis does not require antibiotics, whereas bacterial meningitis is less common. Um, it presents with, in sicker children and all cases will need antibiotics. The symptoms and signs of meningitis vary with age. In very young children, the presentation can be non-specific with irritability, lethargy, fever, poor feeding. Then as children get older, they develop more specific symptoms and signs. The classic symptoms would include headache, fever, neck stiffness, um, and photophobia. They also may be vomiting and may have seizures. If you are examining a child who has elicited those, and you've elicited those symptoms, it's important to document those um, as bacterial meningitis can progress rapidly. In a child with poor perfusion who you suspect meningococcal disease, either meningitis or septicemia, it's important to administer antibiotics early. If you cannot establish vascular access, give the antibiotics intramuscularly and then arrange for that child to be transported to the hospital early. It's also important to let the hospital know and have them on standby waiting for the child's arrival. As part of clinical practice guidelines, you'll be taught to have an awareness of non-accidental injury. Um, as healthcare workers going out to children's homes, you have a unique opportunity to see children in their natural environments. Uh, any concerns that you may have uh, should be adequately addressed and documented. Be aware that uh, child abuse can take different forms such as neglect, it can be physical or emotional injuries. If you have any specific concerns it's important to document them in your notes and also to give a formal handover to hospital staff. Um, also note that there is no mandatory reporting for 
child abuse in Ireland currently, but this may well change. And any concerns that are raised in good faith uh, will be protected by legislation. Mm-hmm.